Thank you for joining us tonight and welcome to the College of Early Childhood Educators uh, first of uh, three live webinars that we are offering uh, this month through our Standards Matter series. And this is actually an inaugural uh, webinar. Uh, this is the first time that we've opened it, um, offered a webinar of this nature uh, openly to the, the whole membership. It will be being uh, recorded and uh, shared uh, with the, the whole membership uh, tomorrow. So before I introduce our guest speaker, Helene Randall, I uh, have a few housekeeping notes. And I'm just going to change the slide. There we go. So it looks like many of you have already discovered the chat box, and that's located on the uh, right-hand side of the um, um, <clears throat> sorry, right hand side of your screen. And uh, so if you do have any uh, questions, you can um, uh, display them there. And our moderator, um, Amanda Welch, will be uh, do her best to, to answer those uh, live as we go along. So February marks the launch of a bi-monthly series that focuses on each of the six standards of practice uh, with the new, uh, with the uh, re publication and enforcement of our new uh, Code of Ethics and Standards of Practice that took, uh, uh, took force in uh, July 1st of uh, this past uh, year in uh, uh, 2017. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to continue to uh, uh, share information as the profession evolves it's important to continually revisit the code of ethics and standards of practice to ensure that you you understand your professional and ethical responsibilities uh, as well as reflect on how you're applying them in your practice on a daily basis so we're kicking off the series with standard one caring and responsive relationships there is a dedicated Standards Matter uh, page on the college's website that features new resources, videos, upcoming webinar details, and more. Uh, and they're all there to uh, inspire thinking and reinforce uh, some key practice elements, such as uh, get you thinking about leadership in the context of early childhood education, the relationships they have with children, colleagues, and families, uh, learning environments. We're going to touch on that this evening with Helene. Pedagogical approaches and communication and collaboration, just to name a few topic areas. And so if you are tweeting, um, by all means, our hashtag is uh, hashtags, hashtag standards matter. So let's quickly revisit standard one. Standard one, caring and responsive relationships. Our ECEs understand that strong Positive relationships contribute to healthy child development and are necessary for children's well-being and learning. Building and maintaining caring and responsive relationships with children, families, and colleagues is fundamental to the practice of RECEs. So now that uh, we're all on the same page, so to speak, I'd like to introduce tonight's, tonight's um, guest speaker, Helene Ren uh, Randall. Helene is a registered early childhood educator who has worked in the early learning and care sector for uh, 31 years. And currently she is the executive director of the Rosalind Blower Center for Child Care located at Brock University. The center provides learning and care for children from three months to five years. And there's a strong emphasis on literacy and nature in their program. Helene is a graduate of Centennial College, uh, Centennial College she began her career with the City of Toronto Children's Services and worked for several centres throughout the city, in addition to working as a resource teacher and home visitor. So I am going to hand it over to Helene now. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, I would like to start off this evening by just giving a little overview of what we'll be talking about. Uh, we'll be starting off the webinar talking about relationships and the learning environment, and then we will be talking about creating an intentional learning environment. Um, what an intentional learning environment is, the four steps to creating one, and how to extend that learning environment to include outdoors.
Uh, can you start your webcam? Sorry. Is that better? Perfect. <laughs> there we go. And um, we also have, uh, I was supposed to ask a poll question as well at the beginning, I believe. So here's the poll question before Helene continues. Uh, thank you for your flexibility. <laughs> um, so uh, this is out to the participants. Do you feel um, that you can influence uh, the learning environment to support caring, uh, responsive relationships? Are you very confident in that? Somewhat confident, a little confident, not at all confident. Okay, and we can see the results coming in. Okay, good. I, I'm I'm presuming. Can you you can vis, you can see this also, Helene? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Good stuff. So a, a fairly strong uh, showing of confidence. Uh, yep, of, of confidence. Excellent. Good stuff, and uh, hopefully we can shift the mark on that a little bit this evening. Okay. Things are think oh, there we go. Good stuff. Thank you. So the learning environment. Um, the learning environment is so much more than just your room or your space or wherever you gather with the children. Uh, there are many other things to consider when trying to create a learning environment for children and for families. Building strong relationships with parents is critical. Uh, we want parents to feel welcome and comfortable in our learning environment. We want the children to feel secure and then we want them to have a sense of belonging. I think back to a time when I started in this field um, and I was working with infants. And we were, were, I was working in an infant room and uh, we had a little guy who was new to us um, and he was just crying every single day. Um, if he wasn't crying, then he was asleep. And most often that was when we were out for a walk. And it really changed the dynamics of our infant room. Um, it was so loud because he was crying, so we were louder. And it was really a stressful situation. And it took a bit of a time before we really connected with his mother. And through that connection and conversation, we discovered that they had moved far from home from a very distressful situation into a shelter, and that the shelter was very noisy and he often did not get sleep. Um, so he was overtired and we didn't know that. Once we had that information, we were able to be more responsive to his needs and it changed everything. We knew that when he arrived every morning, he needed to go to sleep. He had not had a good night's sleep and he was exhausted. And it was really a, a change, it changed for me and a learning point for me about how important it is to connect with parents and have those conversations and how those bits and pieces all connect back to the child and to the environment. Um, and that they're all, um, everything connects together to give a whole picture. So let's talk about the intentional learning environment. And the word intention and intentional is really important here because it doesn't just happen all by itself. We need to have a plan. We need to have intentionality about what it is we're trying to accomplish. And we need to take time in this process to make those changes. I'd like to introduce four steps to the intentional learning environment. Step one, reflection. Step two, observation. Step three, sharing. And step four, responsiveness. Step one, reflection. Taking the time to 
reflect on what it is you're trying to achieve. What it is that you have going on that you might not be really happy with, or if even if you're not sure, just taking the time to really think through what's happening in your environment. You can do this anywhere. You can do this while you're in sleep room, while you're on a break or programming time, even if you're walking your dog in the evening. Just taking that time to reflect on what's happening, what you remember, what you felt good about, what went well, what didn't go as well. Think about things like, how are you present in your learning environment? Are you someone who is more of a monitor? Someone who um, sort of keeps a tight rein on things, makes sure everything is okay, walks around just making sure that there's no conflict? Or are you more of a warm body? Somebody who's there physically, but perhaps thinking about other things, not really fully connected or checked into what's happening in your environment? Are you distracted, trying to connect with the kids, but finding that there's so much going on in the program that you are pulled away in many different directions? Or perhaps you're a nurturer, but you get down to the children's level and you observe and you interact as appropriate. Try to provide one-on-one -on -one support where you can. What is your role in your environment? Some questions to think about. Are the children high energy? Are they quiet? Are they shy? Do the children explore the environment freely? Do they explore it with curiosity and interest? Do you have group time to allow the children to share their thoughts and ideas about the program, about what they would like to explore in the program? Are the pictures are there pictures of the children and families present in your room? Are there cultural materials and favorite items? Is there space for activities for quiet children, as well as for children who want to do larger, big muscle activities? Are you responsive to the needs of the children so do you make areas larger if it's an area of significant interest to the children? When I was putting together this presentation, my colleague uh, was present in the room when I was having a phone conversation uh, with members of the college uh, regarding this presentation. And she, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed that she seemed to want to tell me something. And after I got off the phone call, she said to me, um, it was specific to this particular area about being responsive to what's happening with the children and their interests. And um, she was saying that the night before we'd had a staff meeting and we'd finished up early and the two of our senior preschool educators decided to stay a little bit later. Uh, and what they were staying late for was the result of a conversation that they had had during a team meeting which was about the children being really interested in the dramatic play center or the house center, as well as the blocks. And that seemed to be where everybody was in the room. And yet those spaces were not really big enough to accommodate the numbers of children that wanted to use those spaces. So they were taking that time to move the room around to make those spaces bigger so that the children could really be in there in large numbers, which seemed to be what they wanted to do from what they were observing. So it was great to see that happening here in my center as well. And it is something that the educators do try and be responsive to, making sure that they are observing the children and seeing where those interests are and making changes as needed. Step two, observation. Looking at your space objectively, really looking at it with a new perspective. 
I often walk around my center and uh, look at it and people will sometimes ask me if I need help or is there something I need because I'll just be standing there looking and my response is usually the same which is that I'm looking at the center as if I've never seen it before which might sound like a strange thing to say but that's the type of observation I'm talking about really looking at your space with different eyes perhaps trying to look at it through the eyes of somebody who has just arrived at your center, a new family, looking at it through the eyes of children, so maybe from a different vantage point, looking at it from the perspective perhaps of colleagues, um, just really pausing and observing your space. How do the children function in the space? Are they loud and distracted or are they engaged and productive? How do families function in the space? Are they in and out quickly or do they spend time? Do they come in and talk to you? Do you talk to them? Do they sit down and engage in activities with their children? Do they spend time observing um, or reading documentation or looking at pictures that are displayed? How do you interact with children, families, and colleagues? What do you think you need to consider if you want a space that offers children and families a sense of belonging, well-being, and engagement? Creating a space that provides a sense of well-being and belonging. Do the children explore the environment with interest and curiosity? Are materials accessible and inviting? Do they have only one use or can children use them in many ways? Are the children curious about the materials and activities? Do the children work together? sharing ideas and curiosities? Do the children have a sense of belonging and are parents drawn into the environment through visual displays and displays of the children's learning and exploration? Step three, sharing. Sharing reflections, observations with colleagues and children and parents. Sharing what you have observed, discovered, what you wonder about. Getting a different perspective from all of these different individuals. With sharing and with getting others' input, we can look at things like well-being, finding out what's important to the children and families. What do parents want for their children? What are their hopes and dreams for their children? What is comforting and what is frightening to them? Engagement. Giving families and children a role in creating the environment. They may have items that they'd be happy to share with you that, that you can have in your classroom. Parents will be thrilled to be able to be included in being part of your environment. Empowered. It always feels good to have a voice and to be heard. Having parents and children contributing and knowing that their voice is being heard and being able to see that in the environment, being able to see that they have made suggestions and now those suggestions are being utilized in the program. 
the whole experience of creating a learning environment that is intentional and that is inclusive of everyone is also a great opportunity to create a project, to make it something visible. Document this experience. Document the sharing of ideas. You could do photo display, documentation, and creating this intentional learning environment could suddenly become a project that's including everyone and that is becoming documented in your center so that other classrooms can also take part in this experience. Step four, responsiveness. As I mentioned before, this is an ongoing process. It doesn't just happen overnight and it doesn't just end once your room is exactly the way you'd like it to be. Because as we all know, things change all the time. We have new children who start with us. Perhaps an educator leaves and a new educator comes. Things are always changing. Many different things can change the dynamics of your classroom. And therefore, we need to be going through this process on an ongoing basis. A few years ago, in my senior preschool classroom, it was an absolutely marvelous year. The educators in that classroom were so engaged with the children. Any time I went in there, the children were just busy and engaged with the things that were going on, and the educators were very connected to the interests of the children. Um, there was just so much going on. It was a wonderful, wonderful year of discovery. The next year, the group changed. Younger children moved to the senior preschool, and it was a very different mixture of children. The things that they were doing the year before just didn't seem to be possible. This group of children just did not manage in the same way. It required the educators in that program to really look at what they were doing and how they were doing it. They didn't just abandon everything they were doing, but they realized that they needed to address things a little differently to meet the needs of this group of children. And there were things they needed to change and some things that they needed to adjust and some things that perhaps they needed to eliminate because it just did not work with this group of children and new things that they needed to incorporate. It's an ongoing process. And when we're looking at being responsive, we need to look at the types of materials that we're providing the children. How can they, how can they use these materials? Can they use them in many ways? Where can they use the materials? Are there limitations? Are we making sure that the room is responding to the needs of those children? And are we adjusting things as we need to in response? to the changing needs of the children. What works in September might not work in January, and we need to be responsive to that. Do we set up the room with invitations for the children and provocations? Sometimes things as simple as Having the room set up with activities in various areas at certain tables, not every single table because we want the children to still be able to make choices, but having items there that invite the children to come and explore them. Adding things that might encourage a new trend of thought for children, a new idea provoking some new thought. Perhaps your group has been really interested in constructing things out of blocks and they have left an amazing structure that they worked on the day before. 
And as an added provocation, you've added in a bucket full of animals to see maybe what might come of that. So some questions to think about. Do you have conversations with the children about their daily experiences? And if you do, do you take that information and use it so that the children know that what they share is valuable, that you are listening to them and it's important? Have you provided the children with individual and small and large group spaces? Because we all know that everybody functions differently. We do as adults. Some of us like that slow, quiet start, and others are ready to go from the moment their feet hit the ground. And we need to be responsive to that. Does your environment offer children a variety of natural and culturally diverse materials? Everybody wants to see themselves in an environment. It makes us feel comfortable. It makes us feel welcome, like we belong, like this space is ours. Parents are a great asset when it comes to materials, especially cultural materials, and parents are usually very happy to share. Are expectations for children clearly communicated, purposeful, and decided on collaboratively as, as appropriate? When you have those children who are of age, preschoolers, who are old enough to help in decision making, do we ask the children get a sense of what they feel is important as far as possible rules that are needed in their room. Make decisions together. Are children, colleagues, and families involved in decision making? Going back to that desire to have your voice heard. So now let's take a look at the outdoor environment. Just like the indoor environment, we still have to consider all of the same things. We have to consider how we function outside. When we go outside, do we see that as an extension of inside and another opportunity for us to connect with the children and be present in their learning and exploration? Or do we see that as a bit of a break where we get to sit back or stand back and just be present but not connected. Just like with indoor experiences, if we are not connected to the children, then we're missing. We're missing parts of their day. We're missing parts of their experiences. And we're missing opportunities to bring those experiences back inside with us. A few years ago at Rosenblower, we started a forest school program. And we started it collaboratively with a professor at Brock University who has been studying our forest school program for the last few years. And she would often uh, send us questions uh, on a weekly basis. And those questions really uh, provoked a lot of thinking, especially around those children who were not going out to the forest. So this was a small group of eight children, our oldest eight children, their kindergarten age, who go out to the forest twice a week. But our preschool children stay here at the center and utilize our playground area. And as we would watch uh, the children running to forest school outside the fence and the children inside running, uh, but they would have to stop because the fence would stop them from going any further. It really made you think about the experiences we were offering them. It wasn't so much that their space was contained because they certainly had opportunity um, at, at various times to explore beyond the boundaries of our playground. But it was more about the sense of um, continued experiences that the four school children were having. They were able to construct and build and plan 
things on an ongoing basis, knowing that each time they return to the forest, those items would still be there and they could continue in that process. And when they were back at the center, that they were able to have conversations about what they might do next. But at the center on our playground, at the end of every day, we pack everything up and put it away. So there was never any progression. It was always starting over from where you uh, left off every day. You're starting from the beginning again, is what I'm saying. So we realized that we needed to make some changes. And we started changing some of the things that we had available for the children on the playground. Started having a lot more natural materials that could stay outside so that they could construct forts and dens and build things that could stay outside. And then they could continue to work on them the next day and the day after. So it has really changed our thinking and what we do outside with the children. So as I said, indoor or outdoor, these four steps all work in the same way. You need to take the time to reflect on your program. You can do it daily. You can do it occasionally. Reflection is a great tool. You need to take some time to observe, see what is working, what is not working. Look at documentation. See what's happening with your group. Share with colleagues. Input and different perspectives, always really helpful. I find that I always have a different perspective than the educators in my program because I am not directly in the program on an ongoing basis. So when they talk to me about challenges in their program or have questions, I have a completely different perspective. And sometimes that perspective could, can make them stop and think of things in a different way. And finally, being responsive. Seeing the necessity for change and making those changes. And not being discouraged when perhaps you make a change and it doesn't work out in the way that you had hoped it might. Remembering that this is an ongoing process and we just need to take it slowly and not be so hard on ourselves that everything has to work out perfectly. Trial and error is a great process to go through and it's a great learning tool for everyone including the children and including the parents to say we tried that and it didn't work out but perhaps we will tweak it like this or try it this way and see what happens. We don't need to just abandon it because it doesn't work just means we need to have we need to go at it in a different way try it a little differently the key to creating intentional learning environments time the most precious commodity of them all i'm sure we'd all agree on that patience and commitment don't feel like you have to accomplish everything right away. Take your time. There, there is no set timeline that says creating an intentional learning environment should take exactly this long. It is going to vary from place to place and depending on your group, depending on you. You don't have to set rigid timelines. Take each step slowly and be patient with yourself and with your colleagues and just be committed to what it is you want to accomplish. The results of a good environment? Well, you will see the results. You will see a program where children are engaged and where collaboration exists and where the children have a sense of well-being. You will see an environment where parents feel welcome 
And that's when you'll know that you've achieved that learning environment that you've been looking for. Here from the college, uh, Helene, uh, thank you very much for providing such uh, valuable insights into the impact of the learning environment and um, on developing caring and responsive relationships. So now is our time for Q&A. We have had uh, some members uh, through, through the chat box ask some questions. So uh, one of them was um, sort of back uh, a little earlier. Um, uh, how do you get uh, parents to stay more often? Um, there's recognition that they are busy and sometimes in a hurry. So maybe touching on uh, circling back to that engagement um, and empowered piece, that project approach is kind of perhaps an, another way that we can engage parents. Um, if you can circle back to that concept. I think that um, every parent is going to be different. Uh, there isn't a cookie cutter solution to getting parents to stay. Uh, and I think it goes back to having a sense of your parents. So I think you start to get a sense of what people's routines are. So sometimes you might realize, okay, um, a certain child has, you know, um, a swimming class on Tuesday. So they're, they're in a rush on Tuesdays. Tuesday is not going to be a great day to try and engage that parent um, in conversation about coming into the classroom. But once we have a sense of parents, um, their routine and, and their dispositions, then I think then it's about making those connections. Using parents' names is really important. Um, you know, you don't feel like you know someone or they know you if they don't use your name. So it's so important to build that relationship, use parents' names, draw them into your classrooms. I've always found that Parents want to see pictures of their children. So when you have those photo displays and you can encourage parents to come on in and see what their child has been engaging in, um, it's a great step to letting them know, first of all, that they're welcome to come in because sometimes we're making an assumption that parents know that and perhaps they don't realize that it is okay for them to come on in and spend time in the classroom. And I think that that invitation is always a great first step. Uh, from a member uh, circled around infants in that environment uh, with infants and how sometimes uh, or this member felt it was challenging to create change in uh, that infant environment. I believe you have infants at your center. Yes, we do. And so, was so that, yeah, go ahead. Yes, so speak to perhaps some of the things that can happen within that context. So um, we have a change in our infant room quite often, actually. Um, I mean, we're, we're making changes um, based on many things. First of all, change occurs uh, based on the ages of the infant. So um, our infant environment changes. Um, so sometimes we, like right now, most of our infants are um, just approaching toddler age and some of them are toddler age and we're just really right now just waiting for some movement to occur um, so that they can move up to toddler uh, but that means that the infant program needs to be providing uh, an environment that meets the needs of toddlers as well as younger babies so that changes how they uh, set up their learning environment because now the room is divided a little bit um, so that they have those areas where they can have um, activities for the older babies um, as well as appropriate activities for the younger babies. Uh, but that can change again in a few months where they might have all younger infants and they will change the program and change the learning environment around to meet the needs of those individuals. Um, I think you, you can be responsive in the exact same way in the infant room that you might be in the preschool room. It's about what's needed for the children and um, their development at that time, as well as for those parents. We've certainly gone through times where we have parents who are nursing mothers who come in and want to spend time in the room nursing their babies. Um, uh, or we might just have times where we have parents who really like to spend a lot of time with their children at the end of the day 
or when they're dropping off um, and just making spaces available to be able to have more adults sitting down on the carpet with the infants. Uh, so I think that we're only limited, I think, by our own creativity and, and how we're thinking and how we're using our space. Okay, great. Thank you. Another theme that was um, on the chat was working in, in um, school environments and, and some of the unique challenges that might be faced by RECs working either in kindergarten uh, programs or those working in um, providing before and after school uh, uh, care um, in, again, in school environments. I'm just wondering if, um, I know you're a standalone center, if you have any insights to share with uh, those members where they might, they have a little less control in some situations over the, the actual environment. So that would not be part of my personal experience here at Roslyn Blower because um, we are not a shared environment. However, um, I have gone through um, a series of training um, as a trainer um, over the course of um, about a year and a half. And during that training, um, I had individuals um, at my uh, various sessions who did work in environments that such as you're describing, and it is very challenging. Um, and it does require a lot more creativity, especially when you are using an environment, but you need to take everything back with you. And I know there are a lot of school age uh, educators out there who are using carts and various things um, to house all of the um, items that they bring into the environment for the children. And then they need to take those things back out again. Um, but it really is going to require you to be a little bit creative. And I think getting the children involved, really talking to the children about what it is that they would like and trying to look at some strategies around how you can get them involved in that decision making um, to make those environments interesting, um, even though they might not be your own permanent environment where you can build on what you do there, which would be the ideal. The other thing is when you're talking about um, environments for older children and um, getting parents into those environments, um, some of the strategies that um, have been shared uh, through different sessions that I've been to have included things like not making announcements. Um, it, it is a bit of a practice that some people have where there's those announcements and sometimes it's the children who do it to say Jacob your mommy's coming or and so the children are already packed up and ready to go before their parents really hit the room and um, I had uh, a couple of educators in particular who said to me that that's one of the things that they talked about when they went back to their program when they were really thinking about how do we get parents into the program into our school age program and they decided that they were not going to do that anymore because they realized that they were sort of sabotaging themselves. So there was no reason for that parent to come into the room because their child was completely tidied up and at the door with their coat before the parent quite often hit the door. So really thinking about the things that we do sometimes that might result in um, creating a situation where parents have no need to come into the program. Great, thank you for sharing um, your insights, Helene. Um, we do have to uh, move on with the evening. We could, uh, I'm sure, continue the, the, the discussion. I would also like to encourage and remind members to return to looking at the Code, code of Ethics and Standards of Practice as, um, as a place to find the language to be able to communicate, um, so going back to those school environments where it might be a little bit uh, more challenging around environment and getting others to understand the, the importance that environment plays um, and really uh, being uh, thoughtful, reflective, going back to um, reflecting on what's going on, sharing some of ob uh, your ob observations and having a communication with others who, who uh, might be influencers if you're looking for change uh, in the environment and in the relationship in order to 
best support the relationships in uh, those school uh, settings. So I would, uh, before we leave tonight, we do have a uh, another poll and I do have some um, information to share with you as well. So on behalf of the College of Early Childhood Educators, I'd like to thank Helene Randall for sharing her knowledge and experience uh, with us tonight. And, and thanks, uh, thank you to all the RECEs who uh, took time out of their evening uh, to join us as well. We'll be posting this webinar on the college's YouTube channel tomorrow. So if you found the information shared tonight interesting, please let your colleagues uh, know about it. Uh, the membership will receive uh, the link to the YouTube uh, channel, uh, to this uh, webinar in particular. And then for those of you who gave uh, your email tonight, we'll send the webinar link directly, as well as have an informative companion article to help guide you through the four steps to an intentional learning environment. And so um, the Standards Matter series continues next week. Uh, so please join us for another live webinar on Thursday, February 22nd at 7 p.m. as we explore with uh, uh, RECE Mar Marcia Morgan, Caring and Responsive Relationships, a Balanced Approach to Intervention Strategies. And uh, get involved with the college. Uh, keep our profession moving forward. Stay current. Advance your leadership skills. Uh, consider uh, running for a, a seat on council or uh, putting your name forward to sit on a committee of council. And um, also be a part of the REC community year round. You can follow us on Twitter. You subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website regularly for the latest news. And uh, once again, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And it was a pleasure, Helene, to have this uh, very first opportunity uh, uh, with you to uh, do a live webinar uh, uh, to our broad membership. Thank and you very so we'll much. Just, and uh, we'll take a look at the, uh, the poll here. Looks like we've in, increased on that the confidence level. So that's encouraging. <laughs> all right thank you very much have a good evening safe Happy. travels